All right. Hey, everybody. How are you? We're back again with the great Father Lowe, my dear friend from St. John the Divine in Jacksonville, Florida, and also the author of the book that I love so much that I tell you about every week. Go get it. Renewing You. I absolutely love this book. And so much of what we discuss is actually kind of drifting off of things that I've heard in that book and then also that Father's talked about. So, Father, before we jump in, I want to say welcome. It's great to see your face again and to be with you again. Thank you, brother. Thanks so much uh, to you and to all of the, you know your audience who tunes in and listens to the show. I hope that what we share with them today um, can inspire them and motivate them in their walk of faith. What we're talking about today is children. We're mm -hmm. not going to cover everything, but we're going to cover some of the key principles out of the Bible. And then also from practical experience, um, I think most of you know that I'm watching this, or maybe don't, that my wife and I have triplet boys that are 24 and a half, soon to be 25. Um, and I can tell you this from my experience. If you looked at IMDb, which shows everyone's kind of film, what they didn't film, you'll see starting in 1998, there's a 15 year break where I just did nothing. I actually started my company, Elianos Multimedia. I just finished Do You Want to Dance? And our triplets were born. And I stopped all filmmaking mm. because I knew that the war was about to begin. I just knew it. I knew raising children in this environment, what we were up, I just knew it was all hands on deck. And I was not going to be like a lot of the people in the movies that I portray, which is I never wanted to look back and think, ah, I wish I would have been more present. I wish I would have done this. I wish I could have been there. I should have. Uh, guided them more. And I will tell you this, after almost 25 years, mm -hmm. it took every ounce of energy to, as you said, in I think this sermon or the last one, it's the, the this life we go through as a Christian and, and also in raising children, it's not a cruise ship, it's a battleship. There were so many battles along the way. And I will tell you, one of the hardest <clears throat> battles, keeping them off of drugs. One of the mm -hmm. hardest battles because it's everywhere. So, and Father Hall, you have two children, right? Gabrielle and George. Right. I have a 16-year-old and a 14-year-old, yes. Yes. Yeah, so you're, and, and those, as I recall, I remember the principal of our school saying around that age, he said, you won't know your children anymore. And I said, why? He goes, they change at that age. I think it was around 12 or 13. Mm -hmm. So I heard you in your sermon say about being a priest was tough, but you can finish that thought, what you said. Well, you know, I, you know, I think it's so important to re relate that, you know, as a priest, you know, and as you know, Roxanne's a psychologist, you know, we, on paper, you would say that we would have all the, uh, we would have a lot of the answers. You know, we have the theological, we have the psychological. Um, and, you know, I, we run a very large parish here in Jacksonville, but I will tell you that the hardest thing for me is raising our children in this world. And I'm sure the parents that are tuning in I'm sure feel the same way. We're living in a time where we're seeing um, really on so many different fronts, our children being, um, their, their, their values are being questioned continuously. Their identity is being questioned, um, who they are, not to mention how they see themselves, how they see God in their life, um, who is God and what is their relationship with him. I mean, all these different areas that we're seeing. And I think one of the things that we as parents have to remember is that sometimes we can become so focused in on trying to raise children that do great in school and have great careers and have a better life than what we had. And, and those are all great things to have as, as goals. Um, but sometimes I think one of the areas that we don't really put that much attention in is how are we raising them in the ways of the Lord? How are we training them in, to be good uh, Christians, how to live out their faith when they're facing difficult times? I don't think we empower and equip them enough in those moments. And so the sermon that you're referring to is a sermon that I really talked about saving our youth. Like, how are we as parents? We're given this gift from God. And one of the ways that we give, one of the ways that we acknowledge that gift by is presenting those children back to Christ, um, being um, his, his children and living and, and raising them the ways that he would want us to raise them in. You know, Father says something that it, 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 there was a, when I was, I would drive my kids to school every morning. My wife would make the uh, lunch and breakfast, everything. I would drive them to school. It was about a 20-minute drive. And on one of those drives, just casually, I think they were in seventh, eighth grade, I said, hey, how many of your friends believe in God? They were going to a Catholic school. 
Mm. I thought it was going to be everybody. And they sat there and thinking, thinking, they go, well, I think so-and-so does. And then it was a whole list of families that didn't. And then there was maybe one that did. And it was so shocking to me. And it tied into what you said in your sermon. I'm going to try and put this up here. But I think you said, was it 69% of children have no profession of faith? Is that true? Mm -hmm. Yeah. In fact, what some of the studies reflect that 70% of men, of young men, um, yeah. we're talking about adolescents and young adults um, who proclaim their faith um, uh, as children um, will no longer be in the church when uh, after they're young adult, after they're after they've gone through that season. And then um, within girls, it's usually around 65 percent um, that are having that. So, you know, these are those are troubling statistics. I mean, mm -hmm. even the you know, going back to what you were sharing earlier, um, Bob, in that, you know, the average dad is only spending anywhere between three to five minutes of really engaged conversation with his children a day, three to five minutes. And one of the oh. most influential, um, there was a one side that I was reading that said that uh, parent uh, fathers are the single greatest influence um, in the lives of children, especially spiritually. So, you know, in a society where we're seeing less and less fathers going to church and more and more the, of the women doing that, um, what we're finding out is that if a child is raised in a home where the father does not go to church, the chances of him staying a Christian or staying within a church, I think, is like 5%. Um, so, But however, if a father is actively engaged into the life of the church, along with his children, the chance of that child staying is like anywhere between 70 to 80%. Wow. So it just reveals to you just the sheer power that a father is given and yields in his family. Um, and I think it's one of those things that, you know, um, oftentimes men tend to kind of say, well, you know, my wife kind of does a lot of the parenting. And well, what we're seeing is that that's not what we need to be doing. It needs to be obviously co-parenting, but also reminding ourselves that how significant the father figure is in the life of that of the child. And then you can go even one step further with the life of uh, when you're, if you've got a young daughter, you know, like I do, um, I know you don't, Bob, but as far as, your listeners, um, you know, the father, the way that the father communicates with his wife oftentimes yeah. will reflect how that thought, how that young, what that girl will find is accept, what the daughter will find is acceptable in her own relationships. It's so powerful how we act and communicate yeah. with our children yeah. in their presence. Um, and so, uh, again, it's a, it's a gift that God gives us, but we have to be very, very careful in recognizing that this is a gift that God has given us and he expects he has a return. He has an expectation on it. Um, so um, anyway, we'll talk you know, more about that. I'm sure you know, sure. Father, um, kind of compounding on what you just said, my son's writing these beautiful notes on Father's Day, really just mm. touching. Part of the time when I read them, I'm stunned at things that they observed that I had no idea that meant anything or that they even caught. But I thought it was interesting this past year, when they wrote me a Father's Day, one of my sons, the first thing he mentioned was the, w the way that I treated my wife, Trisha. Mm. Of all the things, that was the first thing he mentioned. So it kind of goes along with what you said. I want to also touch on one other thing that you said in your sermon, which was, you know, alarming to me, that the majority of children today are born, I believe this is what you said, they're born to a single parent household. Did I have yes. that right? Yeah, it's the first time in history, uh, actually. Most children today are are born with a single parent in the house. Um, uh, there are there, the, 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 the what was called the nuclear family back in the day of a husband and a wife um, is uh, statistically no longer exist in a in a um, as, as the majority in our nation. And I and I do want to just as I did in the sermon, and I'll acknowledge the single moms and the single dads that are watching and tuning in today. That you know, God bless you because. The amount of work and responsibility and pressure that you're enduring on, on a day-to-day -day basis, Incredible. I mean, I, I just my prayers are with you because I, I, we don't share these statistics just to share them. These are we're talking about people, we're talking about souls, and we never want numbers to replace the the humanity that we have as Christians. And so, I do want to acknowledge them and just continue to strive mm -hmm. and to reach out to get people that can help you and assist you create that village that we oftentimes talk about. Um, but God bless you for what you're doing, because Amen. I know with two people, with, with two parents, how difficult it is. I can only imagine how difficult it is with, with being a single parent. 
when uh, one night my son George had whooping cough. I, I never knew what that was. And it happened three times over a period of several months. But on the third time, he simply could not catch his breath. Mm -hmm. No matter what we did, we went outside, we put him in a steamer. Nothing was working. And it was, for those who've been around that, it's, it's frightening. It's just a heaving and he can't. So my wife took him to the hospital and I stayed with the other two boys. I remember the next morning they gave him a shot. I think of steroids. Um, and he got better immediately. But I remember the next morning calling my sister, who's a single, who was a single mother and saying, I don't know how you do it. I was a single parent. I, you run to the neighbors. It was three in the morning. And I just had, I have such a profound respect for any single parent that can, can deal with that uh, for a moment of levity, just so you know. So she took him to the hospital. I was freaked out because I didn't know what was happening. And then the phone rang probably about 30 minutes later. And it was Trisha and I heard in the background, you are the worst mother in the world. And I said, mm -hmm. what is that? She said, they just gave him a shot in the fanny of steroids. <laughs> I go, I take it he got his breath back. So, yes. <laughs> so all right. So we have the statistics way. Let's build on, on the theme that you touched on, which was um, similar to how Christ, there wasn't a lot written about it, but similar to what they wrote about in Luke. If you can touch on that and the three points. You know, if you don't did mind. You to, did you want to go to Nehemiah first? Yeah, I think it's important. I think that's a great um, thing just to kind of segue into that is, you know, what I want to share with our, our listeners tonight um, is that if you look throughout history, um, oftentimes whenever God is wanting to do a work within the people um, to make a difference in their lives, to transform their lives, and I'm referring specifically to the history of, Christi of, of what we see in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, Oftentimes, the most vulnerable are the people that the enemy kind of enters and uses to attack. And so we hear about in the Old Testament with the in the book of Exodus, where um, God tells Pharaoh, God tells Moses to go tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Many of you, I'm sure, remember this uh, message. But what does Pharaoh do? He goes and kills the first the 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 the, the first child, the first uh, the young men in every one of the families. Then we fast forward a thousand years later to. King Herod in the um, when Christ is born, and what does he do? Uh, he kills all of the um, the children that are two years old and younger. Um, and we we call these in the in the Orthodox Church or in the Christian Church um, the Holy Innocents. Uh, so what my, what's my point? We see this degradation, this attacking of the most vulnerable, and I would argue that we may not have we may not be having people or leadership, if you will, you know, killing our children, but I would argue that we are seeing our society killing our values, killing our morals, um, killing our um, the ambitions that we that we want in our children, um, things that are just truly undermining our, our life. And there's a powerful message in the book um, of Nehemiah. And if you're not familiar with this, basically Nehemiah uh, is goes back into um, uh, after the Babylonian uh, Empire, and he, he goes back into um, kind of reminding the, the Hebrew nation of who they are called, who God has called them to be. And I loved, um, as you can find this in Nehemiah chapter 4, verses 14, right and you have it already up on the screen, yep. but, but um, yeah, we'll, we can read it. It says, after I looked things over, I stood up and said to the nobles, the officials, and the rest of the people, don't be afraid of them. Remember the Lord who was great and awesome and fight for your brothers, your sons, your daughters, your wives and your homes. And I, I just would ask all of you, as you're tuning in, do you think that you're actually in a battle? Because one of the greatest lies the enemy has convinced us on yeah. is that you're not in a battle because he knows, as we talked about on the show before, you're not going to fight something that you don't think exists. And in the book of Ephesians, we hear this again. We do not fight against um um, flesh and blood, but we fight against powers and principalities. This is taken after the resurrection. This is after Christ's resurrection from the dead. Paul, uh, Christ works through the pen of Paul to write this, that we are fighting against this enemy that is using, I would argue, one of the most vulnerable aspects of our society, our children, in ways that undermine them. And so we have to always ask ourselves, 
are we fighting for them? And to get to the point which you're mentioning too, is you're right, um, Bob, we don't see much in the New Testament with regards to the life of Christ, um, his early life. You, we hear about his birth. We hear about this time that he goes into the temple. But after that, after about 12, 13 years old, we really don't hear much about him. And there's a beautiful co- quote in the Gospel of Luke, chapter 2, verses 52. It says, And Jesus increased in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So I, I'd love to kind of use this as the premise by which if we were thinking about parents in the Bible, why not look at Joseph and Mary? How were they raising Jesus? How were they raising Christ? And so if we just look at those three elements and um, and just kind of break them apart and talk about them. So number one, let's just talk a little bit about what wisdom is. And, you know, one of the things that um, we oftentimes get lost when we talk about wisdom is we think this is all about academic knowledge. And yes, there is a yearning that, that Christ obviously grew in knowledge um, and in wisdom. But there's also the understanding of us recognizing that how we see ourselves also determines where we're going to go. And so when I, when I want you to think about wisdom, I also want you to remind yourself is, of that how our children see themselves how they see themselves in this world, how they see themselves individually, how they see Christ, are going to shape how they live. Um, let's like dig a little bit deeper with this. All of us, no matter who we are, follow a script every day. Um, that script is a is a communication that we have with someone. Now that that someone, oftentimes we may think is a friend um, or a an employer, someone that we're talking to all the time every day. But the person that we talk to most every day is ourselves. We are in a constant communication with ourselves. And the Bible says that the mind will naturally gravitate towards the negative. Hmm. So just so you know, let me just share with you just how um, 78% of our young people today, our young girls today, struggle with how they see themselves. 78%. 78%. I mean, just imagine the, the mm-hmm. amount. These are people that, these are young women that question their self worth, how they look, how they are appearances. And when you look at um, what the what the world is selling right now, it is selling um, a lot of carnal um, acts, behaviors, uh, how people should dress, how tight their clothes should be, all these different things that we see that are perpetuating this lack of wisdom that we're seeing a lot of our, our children have. Um, and so what I want you to think of when I was talk about this wisdom, I want you to remind yourself that we've got to help our children follow the right script because our children may be following a script that God never intended them to follow. Does that make sense? In other words, oh, like- yeah. And I'll tell you, there's one thing. Just a line just came to me. And said that I, I wrote it down. I thought exactly about things that are unimportant to God. Yes, yeah, we, we want to say that line. Yeah, yeah. What I was sharing with with our parish in this message, and it's something that I think is a is a line that you should always, even just in your own walk of faith, is to always remember: we should never make what is unimportant to God be important to us. Yep. Never make what is unimportant to God be important to us, and vice versa. We should never make what is important to God be unimportant to us. I think for so many people, again, going back to that script, if you don't have, if you don't know why God has put you on this earth, the devil will show you the way. Yeah. And that, and for that reason, that's why it's so important to remember what is important to God needs to be important to me because that's, that's who created me. That's, he's the only one that's going to give us that peace that all of us are so yearning to have. And ultimately to have that wisdom that um, that God talks about. In the book of James, it talks about the same thing. It says, well, the wisdom, true wisdom, is wisdom that comes from God. It's not, it's not something that you can see in a book. It's not something that someone tells you. It's the knowledge that you get that comes from above. And so I, I just I would just share with your children, um, and maybe you can convey this to them from us, is that your children will never live a life that they're intended to live if they're not following the script that God intended for them to read. Um, if they don't know that, they just they're going to be out. And I think we're seeing that right now. And follow that up with a other great line that you had, which was um, the life that God has for you is better. Than- oh, yeah. I mean, I, I, this is something that 
I can't emphasize this enough. I was sharing this to the, to the young people, but the life that God has for all of us is so much better than the life that we can try to do on our own. Um, it's it, it's just a matter mm-hmm. though, you know, of surrendering that to him. I mean, at the, at the end of the day, friends, I mean, as a parent, Bob, you're a parent, obviously. I mean, our kids are gifts. I mean, they, they really are. Yeah. We cannot forget that. Um, and so I need to make sure that as the one who's there to guide them in their life, is am I helping them understand that wisdom? And some great things to do, I would just to kind of get even more very concrete with this, is watch what you're communicating to them. Yep. Because our words shape their thoughts. No question. So no be, question. make sure that your words are encouraging, um, that they're um, telling them what they can be. Um, don't focus always so much on what they've done. Focus on who they can become. Remember yeah. that. Don't focus on what they've done. Focus on what what they what they can become, what, who God sees them becoming. Yeah, there's no question because it's so funny. Um, I can tell you things, negative things that my father said to me when I was five, six, seven, eight years old. I can I can remember things because it's coming from that father figure. Mm-hmm. And I'll give you one quick example that followed me all the way through college. My dad, when we would we would mow the lawn in our house. We had a sit down lawnmower and he would have me do it. Invariably, I would run over one of the sprinklers in our lawn. And he just was relentless about you're a drunken sailor and you just yeah. horrible things. If there was a light bulb that need changed, oh my God, Bob, don't even touch the light bulb. But by the time I went to college, I remember I was in my a class, a film class, and they were cleaning cameras. And somebody handed me the camera. And I remember my first impulse was, don't you know who I am? Mm-hmm. And why would you ask me to do that? I'm, I'm going to break this. And it was, I remember thinking at that moment, because I was in California, we grew, I grew up in Wisconsin. I thought, you know what? I'm 3,000 miles away. These people don't know who I am. I've got a fresh start. Mm-hmm. But I will tell you something that happened the very first day of the very first film that I worked on in film school. You have a battery pack around your waist, and it's attached to the camera. On the very first day, I was on the sidewalk, and I went to turn to get something, and I forgot I was attached to the camera, and the camera right onto the sidewalk. And all that stuff from my dad came flying back. And I remember I looked at the camera, and I thought, well, you're either going to break left or you're going to break right, Bob. You're either going to say, hey, that's what it is. Dad was right. Or you're going to just say the camera fell, and we got to move on. Mm. Thank God I, I was able to get beyond that. Because my father at times would also say things like, you can do anything, Bob. So it was kind of a mixed bag. Mm-hmm. Um, but my point is, when I had, when my wife and I had our three boys, I was careful about what came out of my mouth. Mm-hmm. So careful. And 99% of it was, you know, it was God. It was positive. It was moving forward. I was not going to go down that negative road. Because I do think, going back to wisdom, a lot of that wisdom is coming from us. And if we're in touch with God, I think we are by our actions, by our words, are relaying a lot of that wisdom to them. Does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, some studies have revealed, Bob, that you know, this is especially true in marriages. I mean, if I was to ask the couples that are tuning in to listen to the show, you know, if I said to them, you know, tell me one thing that you um, remember, what was one of the hardest things or the most hurtful things that your spouse has ever said? They've done studies on this, that you can quickly bring to mind what that thought was or what that statement was much faster than the nicest thing that someone has shared. And for every negative statement that one says to someone else within the family, studies show that it could take anywhere between 20 to 27 positive statements to simply get you back to where you were right before you made that statement. That's why when people talk about the power of words, we should never underestimate it because um, our words can change the world. I mean, they can change how how people see themselves and how they and what what they accomplish. And you're right. I mean, how many of us remember things that people have said over us and the enemy will use those words and rewind them back to the present day whenever we want to accomplish something or whatever we have a dream about something or even in parenting. Um, And so that's why that that's why it's so powerful that we will talk about this in a moment that we're grounded in Christ, because if you're not, I mean, one of my favorite Bible verses 
simply says that Christ is the anchor of the soul. Yeah. If we're not anchored, we'll be in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean of sadness, worry. Um, we're not a good parent. Um, we, we don't say the right things. We're not, our, our kids are not going to be as good as, you know, Mary's kids over there. Um, and it's just, it just, we, we, we can easily allow the enemy's lies to dictate our life. And we have to be very cautious about that. That's the spiritual warfare that we oftentimes talk about that many people really underestimate. Well, I'll tell you a quick story before we go on to stature. So my uh, son, George had lost a, I think it was a book that had all of his tests and quizzes and I don't know what it was about in eighth grade, I want to say. And he said, dad, I, it's at school. I don't know where I put it, blah, blah, blah. So I said, all right, let's go. And I thought we were going to go over the weekend. I thought we'd find it. So we saw the janitor. We tore the school apart and he was so despondent. He's like, this is going to kill my grade, etc." cetera. And I, I kept thinking, oh, is this going to pass? Is it going to find it? And it did. It ruined the whole weekend for him. And it was on our minds. I drove him to school on Monday and we parked the car because that was something else too. I, as I told them, I think till they were ninth, maybe even 10th grade, I said, daddy, don't do drop off. I never did drop off. <laughs> I would park the car and I would walk them in. Mm. And so we parked the car and I, as we were about to walk in, I said, listen, we're going to pray. Because I know the past week when St. Fanatius, I said, we're going to pray to him. And I turned to George and I said, before noon today, you're going to look at one more place that you haven't looked and it will be there. <laughs> I said goodbye to them and walked away. I thought, what did I say that for? Like that, that was, that, I'm, I'm thinking, mm -hmm. what did I say that for? But I believed it. I went to work, came home six o'clock the night, was, came in the house, was sitting down for dinner. And I looked over and the three boys, it was like they saw a ghost. And I said, what's up? Well, like I, I had completely forgot about it. He said, Dad, at noon, I walked into an area that I hadn't been in, and it was just sitting there. Mm. Well, we owe St. Since that time, we owe St. Fanatis about 20, 30 cakes. <laughs> we have, I think he just said, hey, Francis, get it together. I, I don't, don't lose anything else. Yeah. For those that don't yeah. know, this thing is, is kind of known as the saint. Uh, if you lose something, he'll help you find it. But I'm telling you, and then you're supposed to bake a cake. Mm -hmm. the state. We've lost so many things over the years. Oh, yeah. But it's that, I think I passed that on, my wife and I passed that on to our children. That's part of the wisdom that we've talked about. Mm -hmm. Right. So, all right, let's go to the second part of it, stature. Right. So again, going back to that Luke 252, wisdom, stature was the second one. And stature um, was not just talking about his height or, you know, the way he looked or presented himself, but it, um but oftentimes it's referred to as character. And I think if there is uh, an area that um, we all want our children to have is good character, but where do we get character from? Um, obviously that character in large part is based on our, our walk with, with, with Christ, but also it's with our walk with others. And so I would encourage you when we're talking about character to study your children's relationships. We are a sum total of our relationships. In fact, the Bible says this when it comes to character. It says, bad company corrupts good character. Uh, and that's a, a, a powerful message for our children because oftentimes they can minimize, well, that friend doesn't really bother me or they, they don't have that much influence on, the, on us. But what they don't realize is there is just simply being in their presence. Emotions are contagious. And that's, mm -hmm. that's revealed in statistics. That's revealed in psychology. We can catch other people's emotions. That's why you, you hear that, remember that old saying, it says, you know, um, you know, misery loves company. Well, the same thing is true. I mean, so when you're around people that, yes, you may be thinking that you're different, but when you're around them more and more, you start just like a cold, you're going to catch what they're giving out. And so I would encourage all of us to make sure that what we're, we're assessing who their friends are on social media, what they're looking at, who were their friends at school, who are they communicating with, and look at the character of those people, because that's most likely going to be the character that your children are going to start taking. And when I think about one of the most powerful Bible verses about this, there's many on the power of friendship and the right friends. But you remember that story of the paralytic in the Bible where um, uh, there's a paralytic coming um, and the 
and he's being carried by these four friends up. Mm-hmm. Um, and they, the, the room is so packed. We, many of you already remember the rest of this, but Jesus is preaching in this house. Um, they are, their room is packed. And in Jerusalem, the, the, the roofs are oftentimes either flat roofs or they're clay roofs, much different than what we see sometimes in the West with our shingle roofs or whatever. But they were um, clay. And so these friends were so adamant about their friend seeing Christ that they would literally cut a hole in the roof of this of this home and would lower their friend on this pallet. And the Bible says a very unique phrase, Bob. It says, when Christ not saw the paralytic, when Christ sees their faith, the yeah. friend's faith, he heals the paralytic. And so I would encourage us to remember that the power of those friendships, because we're shaped by the people that we're with, can can be allowing ourselves to allow our friends to either bring us closer to Christ or to keep us farther away from it. Um, and if you're a young person tuning in, you you know one of the um, things I want you to think about is that of a rocket. I use this analogy actually in the uh, in my message to our community. You know, think about like a space shuttle um, taking off. You know, um, the space shuttle has these two rocket boosters that are on either side of this rocket as it's ascending up to this uh, up to uh, space. But there's a certain time when that s- rocket ship, that space shuttle, is entering into s- this uh, into space, where it doesn't no longer needs those rocket boosters. Those rocket boosters were good at a certain time, but then at a certain time that they're 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 let go of. There are probably people in your life right now that have been connected to your ship for way too long that you can't go any further up towards the people, towards the person that God wants you to be because those rocket, those rocket boosters are no longer working and they're no longer productive for you. And so I'm not wanting us to be mean to those people or to be rude or to be condescending to them. But just remember that that ship may have already um, sailed and you need to make sure that the lens by which you're looking at is does the people that are in my life help me to become a better Christian? Help me to look more like the person God wants me to be. And if not, they're just probably a rocket booster. You love them, you pray for them, but it's time to let go if you want to go higher. Did you say it was a previous sermon? I believe this is something you mentioned. Show me, I think it's show me the five best friends you have. And I'll sh- I'll know who you are. Is that yeah, I mean, right? yeah, I mean, there's a I mean, there's different versions of uh, that. But what I typically say is, um, and when I say different versions, different uh, uh, quotes have been shared by people. But I always say, show me your friends, and I'll show you your life. Show me who you're around, and I'll show you where you're going. Um, I, I, you know, I, I wish I would have made better decision growing up with the friends that I had in my life. I, I didn't. I underestimated the my early on in my life and my teenage early teenage years. I was around people that were not making the right decisions, um, and I was so hungry, um, you know, Bob, for that attention um, for the, those people. And I find myself, to be quite honest with you, I mean, it ultimately led to a reawakening of my Christianity. But while I was with them, I felt myself so far from God. And it wasn't until I was at an event that I knew that I shouldn't have been at, where mm-hmm. I was that something needed to change. I knew on the inside, not because I had this special intelligence, I would say that it was God speaking what the Bible calls the inner ear um, or the Holy Spirit up maybe that were, I was saying, Nick, you need to get out of this place. This is not where God wants you to be. And so that's why I challenge you because I wonder how many people go through their life missing out on the dreams that God had for them because they had the wrong people in their life. So don't underestimate that bad company corrupts good character. Also too, and it was a, an interview you did with Dr. Roxanne, father's wife. She said something and they kind of went on, they didn't flush it out. They went on to another subject, but I thought, wow, that's interesting. She was saying something to the effect of, I think she or somebody in her family played the piano. They were heavily involved with the church. But she said, when I met Father Nick, had I not met Father Nick, I'm par- par- paraphrasing this, my faith would not be what it is today. It, am I, have I got that kind of right? Right. Well, I, I, yeah, I mean, I think that in, um, I, I think that with Roxanne, you know, like, like most, you know, I shouldn't say most, but there are many psychologists that, you know, kind of um, avoid religion. It's not something that is oftentimes within the psychological field. And Roxanne, you know, obviously did a lot of education. She's, you know, got her PhD in psychology. So did a lot of education and studying. 
And what she was kind of sharing was that she really was so focused on the academics that some of that was kind of coming in on the inside. And she would say, you know, obviously if she was here that, you know, our relationship and our mutual growth together in Christ, I wouldn't say just me, but I mean, I think our mutual growth together and seeing what was what I valued helped her to kind of rekindle something that she truly valued was, was obviously her relationship with Christ. And now, I mean, yeah. there's a synergy that we have within our, our, our fields that really has made it so, so much beneficial for us uh, in our ministry. Um, but I, I, I can't tell you like, uh, you know, that lens that I was sharing with you earlier, Bob, about, you know, does the person in your life make you more like Christ? Yeah. I mean, for me, you know, and this is not, you know, being some, you know, romantic, you know, just simply being the facts. I mean, Roxanne helps me to be a better priest. She helps me to be a better um, father, a, a, um, a better person of faith, because we're constantly holding each other accountable. And that's what I want for our, our youth and really for all of us is people in our lives that don't tell us what we want to hear, but really about what we really need to hear. That'll yeah. call us out. And that to me is a true friend. Yeah, agreed. Hey, fantastic. All right. And let's go to the last one, which was favor. Uh, in favor. And I have to tell you, this favor is one of the concepts that I have a unclear understanding of. I, when I say the favor of God is on you, I, I always think, well, wait, is it is it not on everybody else? Like what? I don't know. So tell, explain this to me. Well, I think, you know, first of all, I mean, let's, Let's be totally honest and, and, and sharing with 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 people that you know God wants our heart. I mean, He sacrificed everything for us. He yearns to be in a constant relationship with us. Um, and I love this um, this beautiful prayer that Christ prays. I mean, you know, you hear of us of His command for us to pray, but you know, on the night before He goes to the cross, He's praying for us, and He says, He says, I want um, them to be one. And he's praying to God the Father, he's saying, just like you and I are one. So in other words, he wants us to be one with him. And I think that one of the keys that we real we need to realize is that when we that when we are close to God, that when we are yearning, when that it pleases God, it pleases him when we are close. I mean, the one of the most powerful parables is the is the parable of the of the lost sheep, where Christ tells us that the, that the good shepherd will leave the 99 to go get the one. That's what Christ does for us. He, you know, um, and, I, you know, I, to kind of get a little bit, you know, deeper, I guess, in our, in this pool of faith is I love, you know, my congregation. I love them. I love my, you know, them very much. Um, I am, you know, as a pastor, one of the roles is you're the shepherd, but I'm not too sure, you know, if I would lay my life down for them, you know, I, I love them. I care about them. I would do everything for them. But I don't know if I would leave my family, my children, my wife for that. Christ does that. Yeah. And the question you have to ask yourself is, who is willing to do that for you? Yeah. I mean, he's the only God that dies for his people. Like he, he, he the Bible says that, um, his that his body was broken, his blood was shed. Um, uh, I love in the book of Romans, it says that while we were still sinning, he came and saved us. Like, he didn't wait for us to get right and make all the right decisions. He comes to us even in our own filth and even in our own um, sadness, in our own self-destructive behaviors. So when I talk about this favor, it's like God yearns for us to be so close to him. Um, and one of the things that you know we would share with our, our young people, um, and I would argue with us as families, is if the statistics are true, which we would say that, that they are most likely true, that only 11% of families are praying. I mean, that's unbelievable. So, and if only 3% of people are reading their Bibles on a, on a daily basis, and only about 60% of all Christians go to church on a regular basis. I mean, I think God is looking at this going, wait a minute. The very first thing that I ever did was establish a family. He does that in the book of Genesis with Adam and Eve. The very first thing that he does in the New Testament is establish a family, Joseph and Mary with baby Christ. Like God loves the family. And if I oftentimes tell people this, you can always tell how important something is in someone's life by the priority they place on it. Well, if 
the first thing he does in the Old Testament and the very first thing he does in the New Testament, if that doesn't tell us what priority is, God has a priority on the family. And I think he looks at us and goes, wait a minute. This is not the family that I would, this is not the Christian family that I was hoping for. And so how can we as Christians know what Christ is yearning for us in our families if we're not reading what he's telling us, if we're not communicating with him, if we don't have a relationship with him? And so the challenge that we have in that favor with God is making sure that God is at the head of the house. I mean, I love the 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 the, the quote that from the Bible says, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That should be the mission statement that we ha- that all of us have. That it's a we are a God first family. That everything that we do goes through that lens. That when I make a decision, it's through the lens of what would Christ want us to do. That when we're eating, we're praying before we do that. At night, we're praying. And we're not just telling God what we want Him to do for us, but we're just telling. We're also allowing ourselves to, like we talked about in the last show, is Him telling us what He wants from us, what He needs from us. Yeah. You know, so much of. I'll tell you, I think you'll you'll love and this will put a smile on your face. So uh, all three of our boys played football. And sometimes that meant camps during the weekend. And you'd miss church. You'd miss Greek uh, Orthodox events. And when the boys left for New York, they went to college. And then they ended up in New York working. And my wife and I were talking one day. And we were saying, boy, did we blow it? Did we go to too many camps? Was there too much football? Was there too much activities? You know, we really like, did we set them on the right path religiously? That was so critical for us. So it couldn't have been more than a month later. We get a phone call from New York on a Sunday. We're like, hey, how you guys doing? You know, because they would all, they always call us. And he, they said, uh, we went to church today. Well, my, my wife and I just went, cool, you know, we, awesome. because we, we, we were like, I think we faced them. We're like, was, was it a saint day or no, it's not anything urgent. Right. No, we just went to church. I cannot tell you the relief that came over us because, and since then they've they've gone, you know, because you realize in as much as they had a great education, did really great that, had great success athletically and have jobs and all that, man, when that spiritual moment comes along, because I don't know if you've experienced it a lot, but I have begun to experience a lot in my life with friends who <clears throat> had just left the church mm-hmm. and whose children. And, and you start to look, and a lot of those lives have ended up broken. And the parents don't go to church, the kids don't go. And you you just, there's no getting that time back. There's no going back. And so um, I think so much of, at least in my experience with our children, it's leading by example. If they see, especially with dad, I, 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 you know, I'd have to ask my kids, but I talked endlessly, not dreamy religious stuff. Like you all should do that. It was practical stuff. If, if I was in the middle of a problem, I would say to them, well, I'm going to pray about this. We should pray about it. Or when we would sit down, we would pray about, we, would, and I would say things that I had read in the Bible, things Just And a lot of times they would just nod and go, okay, you know, but I think they absorbed it through the years because it was years. And I I, I think that is what had such ramifications in the end in in raising Mm. them to be religious. Now, as my Yaya would say, Makritora, up till now. Let's see how they turn out. (laughs) The verdict is still out. The verdict is still out. But so I just want to go back (laughs) to one piece. So favor with God in your words would mean what? When we say the favor of is close is closeness with Christ. It's a right. continuous development in our relationship with Christ. And that when we are doing that, it pleases God. Amen. It pleases our God when when we are falling more and more in love with Him, when we're growing more and more to the people that He wants us to be, it pleases Him. And He blesses us. I mean, um, you know, right. and he loves all of his children. I mean, he God's God's not unclear about what his mission is for us. His mission is to gather all of us, all of humanity, and to draw them closer to him. And he's using us as the ambassadors, if you will, of that. Let me just kind of go one step further a little bit when we're talking about families, um, Bob, because I think for a lot of families, we can kind of forget 
one of the real purposes of a family. It's not just to grow up, make money and retire, um, which is oftentimes what we get told that's what it is. But throughout the scriptures, the family is also a mini church. And that mini church, just like a regular church, is called to make a difference in this world, to be a light in this world. And you know families, I know families that are inspirational families to us. There are people that you look at and you go, wow, that's a beautiful family. Yeah. Not because they have everything right or they make all the right decisions and they're, you know, they're, they're, there's Romeo and Juliet in the, as, the, as the husband and wife, but they're just people that you say they are grounded. That's that kind of what God is yearning is for us to do that. And maybe you're a single father or a single mom that's tuning in today. Wherever you are, be that, be that family with what you have. Um, yeah. And utilize the gifts that God's given us, whatever that may be, to be the person and the family that God wants. If you're an Orthodox Christian listening to this, I will tell you that on three different occasions at an Orthodox wedding service, the priest will pray over the couple, saying to them that they would be, in so many words, a light into the um, into the community, into the world. One prayer says, remember them, O Lord, as you remembered, and it gives a list of all these different saints. Remember them, O Lord, and then bless them, O Lord, as you blessed um, these different saints and the people from the Old Testament and New Testament. And then it, and then I love this to these two words, so that. I love that. We hear that oftentimes in the Bible, like I will be blessing, blessing, so that. In other words, there's a, a, there's a comma because there's something else that God wants us to do. Right. And in this particular case, it says so that they can be, they can have a sufficiency of so much stuff that they can give to those who are in need. Amen. That's not just talking about food, which is definitely there, but give to people that are in need of a, a kind word, yeah. a, a, a word of hope, a word of kindness, a word of just, hey, you're going to get through this. So yeah. remember that your responsibility is not just to, it's not just within the four walls of your home. A, a beautiful family is one that makes the world itself part of its family, just like Christ did. Yeah. You know, for those of you, I can't you can see it, the poster back there, A Marriage Made in Heaven. There's a scene where the father goes to church and um, the son, the, the actor who played my son, I, at one point I say to him, do you think I was a good um, father? Now, this young actor couldn't have been more than seven or eight. We, we never rehearsed the scene. So we were, it, we were getting ready to shoot it. We did one rehearsal and... He had it so brilliantly. And I just thought, oh, man, I'm not going to say a word to him. I'm not going to direct him. So I'm going to shoot it. If you ever get to see that scene, mm -hmm. he, um, he says, yeah, you're pretty good. And he's, he's eating his food, and he will not look up at me. And it's clear he's thinking, you just haven't been around. Mm -hmm. and, and then he says something. I forget what the dialogue is, but then he goes, I thought it was pretty cool today. And he beams that you came to church today. Mm. And it was so wonderful, this actor, what he did. And I remember thinking to myself, okay, I hope that gets picked up, you know, that people pick that up and see it uh, for what it was worth. But it stemmed, that scene when I wrote it and when we acted it was a derivative of, I knew how important it was for fathers, for men to be responsible in, with their families. And it was amazing when we did the surveys, how many men, were touched by that scene and it made me, made them think I have never met a man who was near retirement or at retirement that said, yeah, darn it. I wish I would have spent more time working mm -hmm. less time with my family. Right. And I'll tell you that is, if there's one thing that I strive for, uh, I worked long, long hours. Sometimes I would stay overnight in this office working, yeah. but I was there to pick the kids up in the morning, take them to school. I, I, there's not, I didn't miss, you know, I hear sometimes dads say, well, I went to all their football games. And that's like somebody saying, well, I got a C on my test. Okay, you passed. Yeah. <laughs> you passed. But we, you know, when I think back on the moments with my children, it was the moment where my son looked at me when we went to doctor and they were, he had scoliosis and he came out and he said, dad, are they going to operate on me? It was when my son, George, had bad nightmares. I would tell him, just come, I probably have an ear open and an eye open, just come to my side of the bed. Mm -hmm. You know, it was when somebody uh, had a broken arm up on the plate, whatever it was, I would always, and whenever I saw them, and I still jokingly say this to him today, if there's a problem, I'll be there in 15 minutes. 
Right. Even though they're in New York, I still say it to them. Right. So it's so important that 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 you as a father, it's just I can't stress it enough. And especially that you're reflect, reflecting Christ. I think that's so in, in the way that you treat people, you're treating people. But that four, five, six, seven, eight year old is staring at you. He may be playing with his toys, but he sees how you're treating. Oh, yeah. I mean, we we share with people. I mean, it's uh, it's a famous line within psychology. It talks about, you know, more is caught than taught. Um, and so they are constantly watching us. Um, and, you know, the awesomeness of our responsibility as a parent, you know, one of the things I oftentimes tell parents is our children live in our subconscious. So no matter what we may tell them, hey, you know, everything's fine when we're dealing with a stress or a worry or when we're angry, no matter what we're telling them, they're living in the emotion. That's why it's so important that when we're having conversations or conflict with our spouse, maybe we could do a show, um, Bob, on marriage. But, you know, when we're having a conflict with our spouse, that we don't do it with our children um, present uh, yeah. and that we're making sure that um, that we also are believing what we're saying to them about our relationship with Christ, that we're leaving it in God's hands, that we're casting our anxieties in his hands because he cares. Um, because again, I think we're perfect parents. We all make mistakes. And I, as a priest, I will tell you, I can give you countless examples of things that I just never measured up with as a, as a parent. And that, but that's the beauty of, the beauty of this is that God gives us a chance every day to continue yeah. to build it, to grow, but be careful about what we're, how we're acting in their presence because they're watching. And, uh, yeah. you know, and that oftentimes becomes, we're teaching them also how to deal with when they go through a difficult time, when they're going through a challenge, how to manage that. And if we're not modeling, let me hand this over to God, then they will not do that. Um, and, you know, it's just one of those things, you know, going back to the church, the prioritizing of church, you know, Christ went to church. Um, yeah. You know, we, we oftentimes think that, well, people will say to me sometimes, you know, and I don't hear this that much anymore, but, you know, just knowing, remembering it from early on in my ministry, people will say, you know, Father, I can I can pray at home. Well, yes, you can. I mean, we live in a free country. You can do whatever you'd like, but that was never God's intent. If you read the book of Ephesians, it talks about that God died on the cross to establish a church. So the idea that we would simply just stay at home and, God forbid, choose football um, or, or other things to watch as opposed to being in God's house. God's sitting there saying, yeah, you, you, you can do what you want. We have free will, but that was never his intent. He yearns for us. The Bible says, behold, how great it is when we dwell in the house of the Lord, when we're in that house. And so I, I've chosen this. I love sports. I'm a big sports fan. We do a lot of stuff on the radio for sports radio and all that stuff. Um, but one of the things I tell people is I would rather put my life in a God who knows my name than in a player who doesn't know my name. <laughs> you know, I mean, That's great. So, you know, you just want to, <laughs> so, I mean, just kind of like making sure that we're kind of keeping this real, you know, so not, nothing wrong with watching sports, right. but God comes first. That's why we do Sunday services because it's the first day of the week. We're right. keeping him first. Um, I'm, I'm going to say one last thing and I toss it to you to wrap it up. Um, with your final thoughts, if I could say anything to parents or even grandparents out there, uh, after, you know, raising kids for almost 25 years, if I learned one thing that I would put near the top of the list uh, outside of God, that, that that's at the top. But the next thing I would put right underneath that is if all else fails, if you can just be present. Mm. I cannot tell you, and I would add a little clause, but present with love. Mm. I cannot tell you the times that my kids, even when they messed up, even when they, 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 they broke half the house, you know, I would always say to them on Saturday mornings, especially when they got to the age of your children at father, when they started having friends, when they were mobile, they could get out. I was the first one up Saturday morning and I would sit downstairs and I would wait do whatever I'm doing. And they would come down one by one. What are you doing, dad? And I would answer the same way year after year. I'm not doing anything until you tell me you don't need me. If you need me, I'm here. If you need me that. and you want to go hang out, I'm all yours today. If you tell me, dad, we're hanging with our friends, but I always let them know you're my priority. And that, and that presence, I cannot tell you the amount of times, the instance they would look back on 
and say, I remember you were there. And it was so critical just being there. You didn't have to say a whole lot, but the fact that you were there, because I think when a child gets all the tattoos and the rings and the nose and all that drugs and everything, what they're trying to scream out to the parent is, I'm here, notice me. If I dye my hair that color, will you notice me? If I put that ring in my, will you notice me? If I get in trouble in school, my grades go, will you finally notice me? And my kids had that from the get-go. 100%, you've got my attention any time of the day. You've got it. And thank God, I, you know, they're, they're still very, very young and have a long time to live. But I would say that would be my, my other tip for everybody is just be present. I'll throw it to you, Father, last words, and then we'll wrap it up. Yeah, I mean, thanks again, Bob, for the time. Um, and thanks all your listeners for taking the time to, to tune in today. Um, yeah, I mean, I just would add to what you were saying that um, children don't always care about what we know. What they care about is that we actually care, that we care for them. And that, and, and especially, in, to use your words, that we're present in love. Um, my final thought would be to all of you is, um, if you haven't done this, I would encourage you to do so. And these are all on line. There are many different ways of doing this, but I would create your family's mission statement. You know, the Bible talks about in the book of Proverbs that where there is no vision, the people perish. Um, it's a it's a powerful you know, reminder to us that if we don't know why God has blessed us with our children, the devil will show us the way to raise our children. If you don't know the why, he will show you the way. And we see that already happening. Any statistic that you're looking at online, and I encourage you to do this on your own, read statistics about mental health among young adults and children. Look at body image, self-image, thoughts, um, struggles with um, addiction to pornography, how much money is being poured into that. Um, I mean, we could speak for hours and hours how much they are under attack. And so the challenge for us is I would sit there and maybe at the very top of that paper, you simply put Luke 252, that Jesus grew with wisdom, stature, and favor. WSF, wisdom, stature, and favor. And ask your family, every one of your family members, um, what is the Bible verse that you want to be as the Bible verse of our family? In our family, our Bible verse is, Lo, I walk through the valley of the shadow of death. We will not fear because you, God, are with us. That's been our Bible verse for uh, well over a year now. We did this a year ago, and it was really powerful for us to hear my kids think of a Bible verse. And, some, and my kids are not fluent in the Bible. They don't read the Bible that much. But that Bible verse, they've just remembered, and it spoke to both of them. And then also ask yourself, what is the values that we are going to stand for as a family? What is, and insert your last name, what is the Lowe family, the Kranz family, or your family name? What are we, what are going to be the values that we're going to stand for? And have that be a genuine conversation, set up a specific time and a place to have that conversation, and then follow that up with what are the values, what are the things that we're not going to stand for? And then the final thing I would ask you is, these are things that we do in our family. And again, we're not perfect. We have our own set of like struggles in just raising our kids ourselves. But I would ask yourself to ask every one of the family members this question. What are our goals spiritually, professionally, and relationally? Now that word professionally, you can also slash academically. So spiritually, what are our goals? What do we want to accomplish in the next year as far as our relationship with God? And how are we as a family going to do that? So maybe it's we want to pray at every meal, that we want to read our Bibles every day. Whatever it is, write it down. These are spiritually, what are we going to do? Relationally, how are we going to talk to one another? When we get angry, how do we want to respond? What are going to be the things that we are not going to say when we get upset? What are the ways that we're going to communicate? How we're going to treat each other? When we get up in the morning, how do we want to be? Those are, that's the relational. How are we going to do relationship? And then academically, like what are your goals as a, as a student over the next year? And professionally, what are the goals that you have as a professional person? What, what do you want to accomplish? What do you see God pouring into you to do mm -hmm. that? Going back to this whole idea that if we don't have the why, if we don't know why God has blessed us with our families, the devil will show us the way to lead our families. And that, right, my friends, is something that we need to stop equipping him to do in our lives. 
And so I hope that that helps you. And in our book, Renewing You, we have an entire chapter on families. So I definitely encourage you if it's beneficial to you. To do that. I love the book. Father, you're the best. No, thank God. He, he's the best. I'm just, I'm just <laughs> sharing, I'm just sharing with, 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 you know, with all of your listeners, something that I'm very passionate about. I mean, we're all in this, like I told you at the last show, um, Bob, is that, and I love what you do, but, um, is that we're all on the same team. I mean, at the end of the day, we're all in the same boat trying to lead our families the right way. Um, and God yearns for us to have a village. And I just want, I think you would agree with this. The two of us, we want to be part of your, of the village of the people that are tuning in. We want to be part of that. That's why we're doing these shows just to kind of yeah. give people encouragement. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I love you. And please say hello to Dr. Roxanne. Hey, now, are we ever going to get her? What's her schedule? Is it We've got to get her because she's definitely the brains and the beauty in this family. And so uh, I will I will speak to her. But maybe the when we do the show on marriage, um, oh, yeah, let's get yeah. her there because um, I'm sure she'll share with you some interesting stories about me that I'm sure we'll, your listeners will find very beneficial. Well, well, one of the ones I want to do, maybe we'll do it next time. I absolutely, because I know people out there are asking about, you know, does God care if, if I fall in love? Is there somebody that, that God has for me, et cetera? And I absolutely, we won't say it now, but I absolutely love the story of how you prayed and how you met her, the black leather jacket, the whole nine yards. I just thought, <laughs> You know, yes. I mean, you and I went through similar experiences. Um, you know, how I met my wife was also one of those spiritual moments. So maybe we'll do that next time. But please tell her. And then also, hopefully at some point I get to meet your kids. I haven't met them, but I, I can't wait to meet them as well. I, I would love that, brother. Thank you so much, Bob. And if your friend, if your listeners are listening are looking for. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah Lord, tell them where to get you. Well, I just I, I mean, you know, we, we Roxanne and I sent out these daily messages. And if you're interested in receiving them. Um, they're just words of encouragement, much like what this show is about. Um, go to our website at thelows.com forward slash subscribe. So that's L-O-U-H-S, thelows.com forward slash subscribe. And all you have to do is simply put in your email address. And every morning at 7 a.m., you'll receive our daily uh, word of encouragement. And then um, Bob's so kind to um, be one of the endorsers of our book, Renewing You, a priest, a psychologist, and a plan. Oh, good. Seriously, if you're if you're if you're looking for some renewal in your family, um, if you're looking for renewal in your own walk, your own personal walk of faith, consider this book. You can find it um, at Amazon.com. It's a five-star rated book. Uh, it's at Borders, Barnes and Noble. Um, but um, definitely um, consider it, and, and just hopefully it'll be. Um, It'll be a and resource for you. And you're giving all the money to charity. You've got these kids are going to go to college. What are you doing? <laughs> well, I, you know, it's one of those things that we just, it's, as you know, you, you pour everything out and God has blessed us so much, um, Bob. I mean, on, on so many different levels. And so this book, yes, the proceeds of this book go to um, the American Cancer Society is one of the big donors because our dad's. Um, both passed away um, from cancer and then doing uh, and then to outreach ministries within our church community that we do. We give almost 10 percent of our um, annual budget towards outreach. And so we just want to help our church do that um, all over the world. So, yeah, um, none of it comes to us. So definitely take advantage of that um, if you're interested in it. And lastly, go up to YouTube if you can type in the lows and go. That's how I started listening to all of his sermons. And it was great in the middle of a hectic day i'd go out and try and get 15 minutes by myself i started listening to those sermons and i thought this is really well thought out in depth very much like when i heard him speak in person and as a person and i i, I would all say go there and start listening to that stuff it is so good uh you'll you'll love and she, ha I believe she has some stuff up there too but if yeah roxanne does there, yes she, she does. they're both so wonderful so can't thank wait you. to see you next week, Father. Thank you. Uh, to talk to you next week. And uh, thank you so much for uh, tuning in and talking to everybody today. I'm sure people got a lot out of this as well. Thank you, brother. Thanks to all of those of you that are listening. We, we appreciate it. Thanks, brother. All right, man. I love you. Love you too. Take care, buddy. Bye. Bye-bye.